Uh, thanks for the introduction, and thanks uh, to Beckman for the invitation for me to, to come in today to talk to you about um, our work miniaturizing RNA-seq library preps on the, uh, the Beckman Echo Liquid Handler. So we're using the 525 system. And uh, just a quick disclaimer that uh, I have to put up that, uh, you can just take a quick look, I'll leave it up for a second. And so um, if you can't catch everything that I'm talking about today, we do have a publication that's accessible on PLOS One describing the, the protocol. And the, uh, the information is also in a detailed protocols IO uh, website if you want some of the more uh, details uh, that I won't be able to, to cover today. So um, I take it that most of you are in, in the sequencing world. And a lot of you have seen this graph before demonstrating the decreasing cost of sequencing over the past you know, 15 years or so. And a lot of these drops have been due to you know, developments from Illumina dropping the cost of sequencing on each new platform that they release. And this has really helped for really sequencing intensive applications such as whole genome sequencing, whole genome by self, whole genome by self sequencing, you know, things that require uh, you know, tens or even uh, 100 gigabases of, of data. But for samples with less sequencing requirements, such as RNA-seq, where you may only need, say, 30 to 50 million, or maybe even less reads than that, um, the costs have dropped so much that sequencing isn't dominating the cost of the experiments anymore. It's really an issue of the sample preparation. And there haven't been a lot of changes on, on that front, just because most people are still using uh, the really good chemistries developed by, um, by kit makers. You know, they did have done a good job optimizing the, uh, the reagents, and uh, so most people continue using them, but the costs have been pretty much stayed the same on a per sample basis. And so, um, you know, we, along with others, have, uh, because of the decreasing cost of sequencing, have developed new applications. And the application I'm going to talk about today is metagenomic RNA sequencing of clinical samples. And what we've done here at, uh, at UCSF uh, has been um, developing next generation sequencing tools to diagnose these difficult infections, especially meningitis and cephalitis. And these are really difficult because there are hundreds of different pathogens that can cause uh, meningitis and cephalitis. And uh, you know, these include bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasitic worms. You know, they span the gamut. And the other issue, it's estimated that about half of the causes of meningitis and cephalitis are due to autoimmune disorders. So these are not infectious. But this leads to this treatment dilemma. You know, if you have an infection, you want to treat it with some type of antimicrobial uh, uh, substance. But if you have an autoimmune disorder, you want to treat with um, immune uh, modulators or immune dampeners like steroids. But you need to make that call right, whether it's an infection or something autoimmune, because uh, if you give someone things that will damp their immune system, they have an infection, you know, you can do them a lot of harm. And we think that metagenomic sequencing is an unbiased tool that can um, identify the cause or absence of infectious agents. So this is a different way of thinking about diagnostics than traditional diagnostics, where you make a hypothesis of maybe a handful or a dozen you know, different things you think might be causing the infection, you test for them individually, if they come back negative, you have to send out for more. If there are hundreds of pathogens out there that can cause disease, uh, you can imagine this being a really long and expensive cycle. And so again, just to set the stage, uh, um, we uh, had started to think about more um, large scale sequencing um, after uh, an, an interesting case come out of UCSF a couple of years ago. There's a, a patient re recurring uveitis or inflammation of the eye. Uh, that had been happening for about 20 years. So this person uh, was a postdoc at UCSF and a patient there. Um, they originally came over from, uh, from Germany, and they were seen by many hospitals in Germany, United States, uh, and never really diagnosed. And this was a, a diagnostic challenge. And so we decided to do next generation sequencing, uh, sequencing the RNA. And a lot of the samples we work with are really, really low input, usually less than a nanogram of total RNA um, input. And so at the time, we were using this Nugent chemistry because it was the, the one that was marketed as being kind of really best for low inputs. And uh, we uh, got some hits to uh, rubella virus. And I'm showing you just a pile up of the reads. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't get good coverage uh, despite doing multiple rounds of, of sequencing. And this Nugent kit, you know, while it was working really well at the time, uh, for uh, what we were doing, what others were doing for low input. Um, it just didn't have, uh, it was also very expensive, so we couldn't do that many samples because it costed well over $100 uh, per sample just to prep. And at the time, we were uh, testing out a new kit from NEB. This is their uh, Ultra 2 RNA-C kit, and uh, we decided to toss a sample on there, see if it would perform any better. Uh, and with just one sample, you can see we got a lot more coverage, especially in the, uh, the capsid region. Uh, which is really important to, uh, uh, to analyze this virus phylogenetically. And when we used that data and analyzed it, um, it actually matched the timeline. So the UCSF uh, you know, patient sample matched most closely to 
a, uh, a rubella sample was taken from Germany in 1992, roughly around the time when this person uh, was infected. And he was actually from the Stuttgart area of, of Germany. So being able to pull this data in was very, uh, it was very cool to be able to, to place the, uh, the virus and it all made sense uh, clinically. So um, that's not the focus of the talk today, but uh, the focus is because we were able to use this NEB prep, which is less expensive, we wanted to increase the number of samples that we process. And uh, there are actually large biobank samples at UCSF of meningitis, encephalitis, and other um, immune uh, disorders and neurological disorders, you know, thousands and thousands of samples. And we'd like to systematically go through all the samples and process them, but we obviously weren't gonna do this by hand. So at the time, uh, we decided to invest in some automation, and this was a, a Biomech NXP system with a, a Span 8 head. And it really helped out because we were able to process, you know, double the samples with a single technician. Um, and it was great. But the one issue is Illumina came out with a new Nova Seek sequencer, and to really take advantage of the cost of that sequencer, really needed 192 samples at a time. And so this would take a little while to, uh, um, to bank up uh, all the samples and prep them sequentially, you know, in sets of 48. And so we really wanted to increase the throughput uh, and miniaturize the preps also to cut down on time because with the NovaSeq sequencing, sequencing costs uh, even lower. And so although that NEB kit was, was cheaper, it still cost uh, in the tens of dollars per sample. So we really want to decrease that sample prep cost. And so uh, you know, miniaturization was you know, the effective solution by using lesser agent. Uh, you spend less on the, uh, the sample preparation cost. And so we're really looking at uh, three systems at the time. There's a Formulatrix, Formulatrix Mantis system. Uh, the TTT Mosquito, and then the Echo 525. And so um, I'll just go through uh, why we uh, didn't go with the other two systems, why we went with the, uh, the Lapside Echo. So this is a picture of the, the Mantis dispenser. And so it's great at dispensing master mixes uh, because you can you know, put these solutions in 50 mil tubes or 15 mil tubes or even a pipette tip, uh, but you can't dispense samples using the system. So if you need to do things like normalization, uh, dispense low volumes of your samples as you're miniaturizing, uh, the system wouldn't work out because it's essentially a, a single channel dispenser. And so um, we kind of mixed this really early on. Another solution uh, that a lot of people have used, especially in these SmartSeq protocols, uh, doing plate-based single cell sequencing has been the TTP Mosquito. And on the top right is just a picture of the Mosquito. And the way it works is it's got a whole bunch of tips that are on a spool. And these tips uh, can dispense fairly low volumes. And these tips get uh, uh, deployed into a head, it'll do a transfer and a dispense. So you have 16 tips that are actuated all at once. You do the transfer and then a new set of 16 tips zips by. And so uh, the one issue over here is, is, is similar to the, uh, um, the Mantis is that uh, all the channels have to dispense the same volume if you're using um, 16. And so again, that becomes a challenge if you're trying to do different volumes or different inputs or different outputs. And the other issue is the tip cost to be relatively high. It's about $40 for uh, 384 tips uh, at list price for, for the system. And so this brings us to the Echo 525 liquid handler uh, from Beckman. And the system dispenses um, low volumes of liquid in 25 nanoliter droplets. You have to use uh, lab site source plates because it uses sound. And so you need to have uh, source plates um, with uh, uh, very um, kind of very high uh, you know, um, kind of production quality. So you get these from LabSite. And they have uh, 384 well plates with working volumes of 12 to 65 microliters or four to 15 microliters. And they also have a six volt reservoir for doing bulk dispenses that can hold anywhere from 250 to about uh, 2 uh, to 2,500 microliters. Uh, the plates are relatively inexpensive, around $10 per plate. And the other benefit is that they're reusable and freezable. So if you have samples or libraries in the plates, you can do some transfers, put a seal on them, put them in the freezer. If you need to go back to them, you can pull them back out of the freezer, thaw it, and then use them again. So once you have samples in that plate, you can reuse that plate, which is really, really useful. And I'll give you one example a little later on in my talk. So other groups have miniaturized other library preps using the, uh, um, the Echo Liquid Handler. And so um, there's one publication up top. And there's a, a white paper uh, down below from, from LabSite. You can take a look as well for some other applications, especially SmartSeq uh, based projects if you're working on that. So the way the Echo Liquid Handler system works is through acoustic droplet ejection or ADE. And this uses sound to transfer liquid. It seems like magic at the beginning. Uh, but what happens is you have a fluid in the source plate. You have a transducer that pings uh, sound energy into the well of the plate. And by focusing that sound um, and um, tuning the uh, acoustic parameters, you can get a droplet that just gets ejected from the meniscus and flies straight up. And so the droplets are very uniform in volume, and depending on which system you're using, it uses either a 2.5 nanoliter droplet or a 25 nanoliter droplet. 
And the system we're working with is the 525 series, which does the 25 nanoliter droplets. So your dispensing increments are in you know, 25 nanoliter droplets on the system. And this is a video of the Echo 555, but uh, in principle, the 525 works the same way. You load in a source plate with your material. There are deionization bars to get rid of static to make sure that the droplets fly straight up. You load on a source plate. They can be a PCR plate, a 96, 384, um, any, most SBS formatted plates will work. There's a transducer down below that's coupled to water, so uh, sound travels through water much better and doesn't travel through air as well. The system does a survey to analyze the volume of, uh, of liquid in each, uh, each of the wells, and then it starts to transfer. So again, you transfer in individual droplets. They shoot straight up into this inverted um, destination plate. And what's cool about the system, you might think 25 nanoliters is not a lot, but it can actually transfer a couple hundred uh, droplets per second. So you can build up volumes fairly quickly, and the transducer moves pretty quickly underneath the plate. And the other benefit is you can transfer different volumes um, in each of the wells, and you can do different combinations of mixes. So this has been really useful for some synthetic biology applications as well. And then the uh, source plate and destination come out, and then that's it. So it seems like magic, but it, it works and it's wonderful. So uh, before I get into uh, the experimental details, I just want to talk about the specific kit that we're using, this NEB Ultra 2 RNA workflow. So you start off with RNA, uh, you add a RT uh, buffer mix with random hexamers, you do a fragmentation to break up the RNA into NGS sized fragments. Then you go into a reverse transcription, sex transsynthesis, and then you have a cleanup step. And at this point, uh, you're, you're working with double-stranded DNA. Uh, next, you do standard kind of library prep chemistry with N repair, A tailing a ligation, and then another cleanup at the end. And then lastly, a, a PCR reaction to amplify up your library and to index them. And then there's a, generally a cleanup at the end of that as well. And at that point, you quantify your individual libraries, make your pools, and run them on your sequencer. And so our goal was really to miniaturize this by tenfold. And so um, what you see under 1x is like the, the hand prep or standard volume prep. And then on the right are the volumes of the, uh, the tenfold uh, miniaturization. And you can see there are a couple of challenges. One thing is the sample input changes from 5 microliters to 0 0.5 microliters. So uh, 0 0.5 microliters, although the echo can definitely transfer that, a lot of times uh, you might want more material than you can transfer in, in half a microliter. So that's something we had to, to deal with. Uh, the second issue is that each of these asterisks marks a, a procedure where you have a bead cleanup afterwards. So you can't do a bead cleanup on the echo right now. Um, I don't know if that will ever be, be possible. So you still need to do standard, standard cleanups. And so the problem with these standard cleanups is that uh, with our protocol, it requires elutions as low as five microliters. And the 384 well magnet that most people use has a minimum elution volume about 10 microliters. So these are two issues we had to address, the input volume and then the cleanup elution volumes. And so with uh, input volumes, the simple solution was just to dry down your RNA. You can dispense a larger volume, put into a speed vac, dry it down. And uh, so we're just using this old uh, um, speed vac uh, that we have in lab, just a plate-based speed vac. We would transfer our, our samples into a PCR plate that we do library prep in. We go and dry it down. And what was cool is we don't see any RNA degradation. And then after it's been dried down, you just resuspend it in that first master mix. And then uh, that allows you to, uh, to put in more RNA that's possible with a 0 0.5 uh, microliter input volume. So the one thing we wanted to check is to, just to make sure that the uh, integrity of the RNA was still uh, was still fine. And so um, on the top, you see uh, just the initial RNA, what it looked like. And on the bottom are two other experiments where we dried down the sample and then reconstituted back in RNAs free water. And you can see that the RNA is still uh, you know, high quality. So with this, we decided that you know, the solution was fixed and we could go and address the other issue, which was the elution volume issue. And so this is an example of this uh, Alpaqua 384 well post magnet plate um, that we use for the cleanups in 384 well format. And so the PCR plate just sits on top, and then beads stick to the, uh, essentially to the top of the magnet uh, over here, but inside of the well. And so um, our solution was to uh, print out a, a little 3D printed uh, jig. And so this file is online. You can, you can download it and then get it printed out for just a couple of dollars. Um, but essentially what this does is it sits on top of this plate. Um, you can see it over on the right-hand side. And because it sits on top of the plate, it acts as a spacer. Um, that will uh, lift up your PCR plate a little bit. And so on the left-hand side is an example with a 5 microliter elution volume with the, uh, the magnet as it's uh, um, without the spacer. You can see that the uh, elution volume doesn't actually hit the bead. And so you wouldn't get uh, good elution just by pipetting. 
On the right hand side, because we put in the spacer that lifts the plate by a couple of millimeters, uh, that effectively brings the beads down a little bit into the well of the plate so that a five microliter, five microliter elution is now able to, to resuspend the beads. And so just as a, a general, um, so we were able to run through the protocol and, and generate uh, uh, you know, libraries from this. And so on the left-hand side is the bioanalyzer trace of the standard volume library with a 10 nanogram input. Um, on the right-hand side, we decided to, to try um, different types of, uh, of input amounts from 0.5 nanograms up to 50 nanograms using the miniaturized protocol, decrease everything by, by tenfold in volume. And you can see the, uh, um, the curves look really, really similar. The only difference is the number of uh, PCR cycles uh, between the, uh, the different inputs to account for that. Uh, but in general, the, uh, the um, libraries look really good um, on this, uh, just on the bioanalyzer. Uh, if we actually sequence those libraries and, and do a comparison, um, on the uh, left-hand side is a hand prep, on the right-hand side, or left-hand y-axis is uh, the hand prep, and on the x-axis is the, uh, the echo preparation. And so I'm just showing you on the left-hand side, a, a, PBM, uh, a PBM sample, and on the right-hand side is just a HeLa RNA control sample. And you can see the uh, um, results look really, really comparable. Um, and so we're really, really happy with this. And so we've uh, essentially moved ahead and have used this protocol um, to do all of our, our RNA-seq library prep methods um, just because we can crank out uh, 384 samples uh, with one technician one day. Um, and that's limiting only because we have uh, uh, one, one thermocycler. If we had multiple thermocyclers, you can imagine even staging uh, multiple plates uh, over the course of a day. And one technician could do multiple 384 old plates, which is uh, a huge increase in, in throughput. So one challenge when you're working with uh, more libraries is how do you normalize the, uh, the input? Quantitation can become an issue as you scale up the number of, of samples that you do. Uh, the gold standard most people uh, you know, uh, would like to do is qPCR on all the samples, but that can be expensive and it can also take a, a lot of time because you have to do dilutions of your, of your libraries uh, to get it within the working range of the qPCR assay. And so our solution has been to normalize our sample pools by sequencing. And the idea is that um, why don't you just sequence using a really inexpensive uh, uh, MySeq kit, which can cost as low as $300 to quantify 384 samples. You get sequencing data out, and because all the samples are barcoded differently, in that initial sequencing run, you can see the relative concentration to each individual sample. You can go back to the echo with that data and make a custom pool where you, where you alter the amount of the volume of each of the samples so you have a normalized library concentration across all 3D4. And this is just some data that we generated comparing um, the same library run on either the NovaSeq or the MySeq. And we have some samples that were at relatively high concentration, so in the range of uh, you know, two to three and a half percent of the pool, and some at much lower concentrations at you know, 0.2 to 0.35% uh, of the pool, just to take a look at the two ranges. So I'm just splitting up in different graphs just so that uh, you can take a look at each set a little bit closer. But you can see the correlation between the, uh, the MySeq and the NovaSeq is really, really high. And so this uh, um, gave us comfort that you know, we could actually quantify uh, with this method. So one cool thing about uh, using the ECHO to do this type of quantification by sequencing is that um, it gets rid of the final cleanup step of each individual sample. So the idea is once you've done your final PCR to amplify up your libraries and index them, you don't do a cleanup. You transfer that into an echo source plate. You have your samples now in the echo source plate. You transfer an equal volume of each, say 200 nanoliters or 500 nanoliters, and you make a pool. You take that pool, you do a single cleanup in an Empedorf tube. So you're not cleaning up 384 samples. So you clean up that one pool, you run that on your small scale sequencer, you get the data back. You go back to the source plate that you can pull back out of the freezer, transfer different volumes of each sample so you get equal number of reads from each, do one cleanup in one single tube, and then go on to your NovaSeq. And so this really cuts down on that last cleanup, uh, which is really beneficial as well. And so yeah, so this is the, uh, the idea. You repool single tube cleanup and then run on the production level sequencer. And so again, this is something that's enabled by the, uh, um, uh, by the ECHO's you know, unique capabilities and how it hit transfers. It's not as efficient if you had a traditional TIP-based uh, system because it, it does take a little while to transfer uh, samples one at a time with a TIP-based system. But because the ECHO is so fast, it can do this pooling in under five minutes. So that's how fast the machine is. And so you could also use uh, plate-based quantification methods like uh, Pico Green or Cyber Green and a plate reader if you wanted to do that. 
Um, uh, in this case, you would have to do uh, <coughs> an individual cleanup of each sample. And uh, lastly, I just wanted to touch on this point that you can also use this to quantify your input RNA as well. You can use a plate-based RNA quantification assay. And then using the echo, you can transfer different volumes into that initial PCR plate that you dry down to normalize your inputs. All right, so one thing that you might ask is I didn't talk about ribosomal RNA removal. And so at the time we were working on this, uh, um, this project, there weren't good methods of doing ribodepletion um, with samples that had less than a nanogram of input. So we came up with our own method called DASH that uses this Cas9 based method. So Cas9 uh, is the enzyme that cuts DNA. And so what we did was we, and it's programmed by these guide RNAs. So we created a pool of guide RNAs that specifically target ribosomal RNA sequences. And so we go through a library prep uh, and then we amplify up the library a little bit. So we have DNA now. Then we treat it with our Cas9 pool that will cut all those ribosomal RNA sequences in the library amplify up again to enrich for everything that wasn't cut by the guides. And so, uh, you know, this worked uh, pretty well at the time. The downside is it's not commercially available, and so most people are looking for a commercial solution. And we haven't tested this, but the RNAs-H-based methods uh, that a lot of groups uh, have out now, I know Lexigen, NEV, and, and Kappa have these RNAs-H-based methods, uh, should be miniaturizable um, as well. But one thing, one commercial solution we have tested is one from Kaijin. It's called their, their Fast Select. Uh, system. And this is also a probe-based method, but it doesn't require any extra cleanup. So um, the way the system works is that it has a pool of probes that binds to ribosomal RNAs in the RT reaction. And uh, they have special modifications to prevent reverse transcription uh, from happening on those targets. So this blocks reverse transcription over the targets that the probes bind to. And so there's no extra, um, there's very little extra work. You add one more reagent to your RT master mix. After your fragmentation, you just do a slow cool down that adds about five minutes or so to, the, uh, to do annealing before you add the RT enzyme. And it works well for FFP. So over on the top right hand side is some, some data of FFP RNA. So that's data that uh, you know, Kaijin uh, has publicly available. So it works really good there, uh, which is really attractive just because there are tons and tons of bank samples that people would like to work on with FFP, but it's always been challenging. Um, the other cool thing about Fast Select is that, um, you know, it's geared to work to up to a microgram of, of input RNA. And since we're working with a really low inputs, you know, nanogram or less, we can actually dilute this down a hundredfold and it still works. And so by diluting it down, it actually really decreases the cost uh, as well to uh, less than a dollar sample in terms of added cost to do the ribodepletion. Over on the right is some data that we generated. Again, diluting this reagent down by uh, uh, one to a hundredfold. You can see that it really decreased the amount of ribosomal RNA and the CSF samples that we've been processing. Uh, so this is kind of a little summary slide of uh, you know, what the ECHO can do. It can really increase your throughput and decrease costs. So I'm comparing a, a hand prep by a technician you know, working two hard days versus the Biomec NXP, which is you know, uh, a great increase in, in throughput. You, know, you more than double your, your throughput with that system. But if you compare that with the ECHO 525 liquid handler, um, it helps out uh, you know, even more with the system. And this also really decreases the cost per sample because you're decreasing your, uh, your agent usage from around $30 to $40 per sample down to you know, $6 a sample, uh, which really helps you scale up uh, um, these, uh, these projects. So our ECHO currently works in standalone mode. This means that the technician moves the, the plates onto the ECHO, move it onto the dermocycler to do the cleanup. They move on to our 384 well you know, Biomech NXP system to do the cleanup. So there's still a lot of manual intervention and one thing we're looking forward to doing is actually automating the entire workflow with automation arms that will automate the process. So the idea is in the morning you just load up your dried RNA, uh, your reagents onto chilled positions on the deck of a, of a um, liquid handler, and then hit go. And this will move the plates between the echo liquid handler, uh, your, um, your tip-based liquid handler like the Biomex systems, and then your automated thermocyclers. And this allows uh, you know, true walk-away um, uh, autonomy, and this frees the staff to form other jobs such as RNA extraction, downstream QC, and, and things like that. Um, so just again, in, as, uh, as a summary, you know, sequencing prices drop, you know, sample preparation, and mainly those reagent sample preparation dominate these project costs. And so the, the simple solution really is to miniaturize and use less reagents if those are your cost drivers. And this is really possible with the Echo 525 liquid handler. Um, besides miniaturization, it really changes the way that you can think about how you go through your library prep workflow. Again, some of those examples with uh, um, you know, how you quantify your samples at the end or how you normalize you know, inputs. These are all things that are very easy to do once you understand 
uh, some of these benefits, these unique benefits and characteristics of the, uh, the liquid handler. And it results in more even data across your samples, and it saves both time and money. So it's been a, an awesome experience to, uh, to be able to work uh, on this platform um, and to uh, present this work today. So I just want to acknowledge a, a couple of people. Uh, there's Joe Derisi. <coughs> Uh, Tweed Don and Michael Wilson were uh, two kind of fellows in Joe's lab that have started their own labs. In Joe's lab, there's uh, Madeline Mayday, Lillian Khan, and Matt Zinter, uh, who really helped uh, a lot with the developing of the method. Uh, Tweed was involved in that uvi disk case I talked about at the beginning. It's doing a ton of metagenomic sequencing of like eye samples, like sticking needles into eyes, taking out little volumes, and seeing what type of uh, infections are, are present in eyes. Uh, really challenging stuff and really low inputs, and stuff that she's doing on the Echo. Uh, and Michael Wilson's lab is doing a lot of uh, work in the neurology space, and he's working through thousands and thousands of samples now uh, using a, uh, uh, the ECHO. And Prashant Ramachandran, his lab has been doing the work on looking at the, uh, um, the Kaijin fast select uh, data that I showed. So, you know, with that, I'm happy to take any questions.